Hello, everybody. About a half a minute till we start here. I just want to make sure you are all seeing me well and that this is all looking good, which it is. I'm always looking good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks for joining us. So this is, what, episode three of Patriots History of the United States. And as always, I'm going to read through our New York Times number one bestseller, Patriots History of the United States, and where appropriate, I'll pull in some documents from the Patriots History Reader. And as always, I'm going to stop, give commentary, discussions uh, on various aspects of, of uh, Patriots History of the United States. So let's get started. So officially, we're, we're starting um, Episode 3 of Patriots History of the United States. In previous episodes... Um, we have looked at um, the introduction and the foreword to the 15th anniversary edition. And what we're starting today now is our, our second real dive into Chapter 1. <clears throat> Last time we, we looked at Columbus and um, an exceptional man and had exceptional journeys and I gave you a number of sources, and we discussed a number of the sources there. And so mm -hmm. let's continue now. What we're going to be looking at is Patriots History of the United States. It's Chapter 1, City on a Hill. And I will be reading from page 5, the very bottom of the page where we left off. Um, Once Columbus blazed the trail... Other Spanish explorers had less trouble obtaining financing backing for their expeditions. Vasco Nunez de Balboa, 1513, crossed the Isthmus of Panama to the Pacific Ocean, as he named it. <clears throat> Ferdinand Magellan, 1519 to 22, circumnavigated the globe, lending his name to the Strait of Magellan. Other expeditions explored the interior of the newly discovered lands. Juan Ponce de Leon, traversing an area along Florida's coast, attempted unsuccessfully to plant a colony there. Of course, you know the legend as he was searching for the fountain of youth. Spaniards crossed modern-day Mexico, probing interior areas under Hernando, Hernando de Cortez, who in 1518 led a force of 1,000 soldiers to Tenochtitlan, the site of present-day Mexico City. Cortez encountered powerful Indians called Aztecs, led by their emperor Montezuma. The Aztecs had established a brutal regime that oppressed other natives of the region, capturing large numbers of them for ritual sacrifice in which Aztec priests cut out the beating hearts of living victims on a little platform there and then kicked the bodies down into the lake. Such barbarity enabled the Spanish to easily enlist other tribes, especially the Tlaxcalans, in their efforts to defeat the Aztecs. Um, a note here, this, of course, is a chapter in a book I've already referenced by um, the historian Victor Davis Hansen great book called Carnage and Culture. And uh, this is one of the first battles that he looks at, and he points out the Western advantages in terms of, of uh, Castilian steel, in terms of um, uh, organization. One of the key elements here that Hansen discusses is that it was not musketry or uh, firepower or this kind of advanced technology in that area that enabled the Spaniards to be so successful. Uh, but let's keep reading, and we'll, we'll discuss this more here in a moment. Tenochtitlan sat on an island in the middle of a lake connected to the outlying areas by three huge causeways. It was monstrously, start again, it was a monstrously large city for the time, of at least 200,000, uh, rigidly divided into nobles and commoner groups. Aztec culture created impressive pyramid-shaped temple structures, 
but Aztec science lacked the simple wheel and a wide range of pulleys and gears that enabled that it enabled. But it was sacrifice, not science, that defined Aztec society, whose pyramids, after all, were execution sites. A four-day sacrifice in 1487, records show, by the Aztecs, King Athuizal involved the butchery of 80,400 prisoners by shifts of priests working four at a time around the clock at a convex at convex killing tables after ripping out their hearts the priests kicked the lifeless heartless bodies down the side of the pyramid temple this worked out to quote a killing rate of 14 victims a minute over the 96 hour bloodbath unquote in addition to the abominable sacrifice system, crime and street carnage were commonplace. More intriguing to the Spanish than the buildings or even the sacrifices, however, were the legends of gold, silver, and other riches Tenochtitlan contained, protected by the powerful Aztec army. Along the way to Tenochtitlan, Cortes gained an alliance of many tribes hostile to the Aztecs, partic particularly the aforementioned Tlaxcala, who accompanied him to Tenochtitlan. Unopposed at first, Cortes was received by Montezuma, who, according to most historians, used the meeting to assess his enemy's weaknesses. But after treachery by the Spanish, Montezuma was killed and Cortes' men were driven from the city with heavy casualties. They narrowly escaped extermination. Desperate Spanish fought their way out on the Noche Triste, the sad night, when hundreds of them fell on the causeway. Cortez's men piled human bodies, Aztec and European alike, in heaps to block the Aztec pursuers, then retreated to Tlaxcala, where the Spanish recovered under the protection of their Indian allies. Shortly thereafter, a debilitating smallpox epidemic called by the Aztecs the, quote, Great Rash, swept through both camps. But disease particularly devastated the Aztec leadership and prevented them from destroying the shattered Spanish. In 1521, Cortes returned with a new Spanish army supported by more than 25,000 Indian allies. Using gunboats from the lakeside, and his ground forces landward, he cut off supplies to Tenochtitlan. Starvation killed those Aztec whom the disease did not. Quote, they died in heaps like bedbugs, wrote him one historian. Even so, neither disease nor starvation, nor the ever popular view that the Aztecs thought the Spanish were gods, accounted for the Spaniards' stunning victory over the vastly larger Aztec forces. Remember, they're outnumbered about 100 to 1 in military forces. Rather, the Spanish victory can be credited to their use of European-style discipline shock combat, mm -hmm. employing steel swords and pikes versus Aztec wooden stone-tipped weapons, and their use of modern firepower, including cannons, muskets, and crossbows. Severing the causeways, stationing huge units to guard each, Cortes assaulted the city walls from 13 brigantines the Spanish had hauled overland, sealing off the city. These brigantines proved, quote, far more ingeniously engineered for the fighting on the Aztecs' native waters than any boat constructed in Mexico during the entire history of its civilization. When it came to the final battle, it was not the brigantines, but Cortes' use of cannons, muskets, harquebuses, crossbows, and pikes in deadly discipline, firing in order, and standing as a unit against a murderous mass of Aztecs who fought as individuals rather than as a cohesive force that proved decisive. Spanish technology, including the wheel-related ratchet gears on muskets, constituted only one element of European military superiority, they fought as other European land armies fought, in formation with their officers open to new ideas based on practicality, not theology. 
Where no Aztec would dare approach the godlike Montezuma with military strategy, Cortes debated tactics with his lieutenants routinely, and the European way of war endowed each Castilian soldier with a sense of individual rights, civic duty, and personal freedom non-existent in the Aztec kingdom. Moreover, the Europeans sought to kill their enemy and force his permanent surrender, not forge arrangement for a steady supply of sacrifice victims. That's a big difference. Thus, Cortes captured the Aztec capital in 1521 at a cost of more than 100,000 Aztec debt. All right, a, a few things about this here. First, um, maybe you've heard that, um, that the uh, Aztecs thought the Europeans were gods. This is not true. Uh, they obviously had captured many Spaniards before this and had tortured them, killed them, knew they were not gods. So you can scratch that explanation. Secondly, horses. Oh, they were impressed by the horse. The horses caused the, the whole thing to collapse. No, this is nonsense. It is true there were no horses in this area of Central America, North America at that time. However, there are all sorts of cave paintings of horses, and horses were... Um, quite plentiful in North America prior to the time they were uh, wiped out apparently by either Indians or natural causes. So they were familiar with the concept of a horse. They didn't think it was some magical animal. Um, and they knew they could kill horses as well. Third, disease. Um, come on, folks. Smallpox is an equal opportunity killer at this time. It killed the same proportion of Spaniards as it did Aztec. So if the Aztecs lost 5% of their population to, um, to smallpox, the Spanish forces likewise lost 5% of their numbers to smallpox. Um, as I said, the only mitigating factor there was that some of the Aztec leadership may have disproportionately uh, fallen possibly because of the way they lived. We're not sure. Um, but at any rate, that only reinforces this larger point that um, I'm, I'm making here that Victor Davis Hansen makes, that it was not the technology per se, but the Western way of war. And the Western way of war was based on the following. First, human life is valuable. Um, this comes, of course, from Christianity and Judaism that says that human life is valuable. You don't just execute people to have a sacrifice to some god. Human life is important. Uh, now, yes, we're going to go into all sorts of things about, well, the Spaniards had the Inquisition. They tortured people. And they, yeah, not on this level. Nowhere near you're killing 14,000 in ritual sacrifice. It's just it's, it's not done. Um, because... This goes all the way back to the Greeks now and the Romans to some extent because human life was viewed, you know, existentially. I understand there's practical issues like Nero and Caligula and all that. But because human life was, in theory, valuable and, and uh, important, uh, wars were deemed to be something that you um, did when you had to do them. Uh, they weren't the norm. You didn't just fight to fight. You didn't fight for glory. You certainly didn't fight normally to capture large numbers of, of slaves that you could then ritually sacrifice. So because wars were viewed as not the norm, peace was viewed as the norm, and this is especially true as you get more into the late 12, 1300s, um, wars are expensive. And rulers know that they want to fight a war, they've got to find a way to pay for it. And increasingly, they know by the 1400s that funding these wars creates problems because you have to either raise taxes, you've got to find a way to get the nobles to contribute, you've got to uh, do away with other civic pro programs, whether it's road building or port building or something that, that might get you more economic growth. Mm -hmm. um, so all of these things take a toll on wanting to fight perpetual war. Yeah, there's a lot of wars, a lot of small wars that go on. We're talking fairly small armies. In many of these wars, you got two or 3,000 guys on each side. And Cortez, 
of course, has something like uh, 1,200 men, maybe only 1,000. And out of that, he's got maybe 200 cavalry, and all the rest are pikemen and har harquebusers and crossbowmen and then a couple of cannons. Um, so it's a tiny, tiny army to conquer a nation of a couple million people, uh, 200,000 alone in Tenochtitlan. Um, so the idea was that wars were to be avoided, uh, use other means if you could to achieve your political purposes. And, and so when you fight a war, this is the Western way of war now, when you fight a war, your goal is to end it as quickly and decisively as possible, not just perpetuate it so that you have a shame honor thing going where you've got to kill a few people and you got the honor and now the other guy has to retaliate so he gets the honor. That's not the goal. You want to fight it to the end and, and wipe out your enemy, either force total absolute surrender or, or kill them uh, so you don't have to deal with them again. And so these wars generally are fought to a kind of unconditional surrender or a treaty that lays everything out that says um, there's not going to be another war here. Um, and, and so to achieve that, this is Hansen's theory now, to achieve that, Western militaries, far more than militaries in other parts of the world, in China or in the Middle East, uh, and certainly the Aztecs, Western militaries engage in shock combat. They want to close with the enemy, but here's, here's the key. In closing with the enemy, you want to maintain formation. You all think of the Greeks in uh, the, the movie 300 with the Spartans behind their shields or the Roman legions locking those shields and mar marching forward. At the very least, staying very close to each other where you're providing cover so somebody can't get you from the side or get you from behind. And you're, you're protected by these walls of shields. Well, by the 1400s, they had ditched the shields, but they still had these walls of spears or pikes that kept an enemy at distance so they couldn't close with these flat weapons that the Aztecs had. So an, an Aztec, think of a an old fraternity paddle. <laughs> Some of you know what I'm talking about here. And and you put inside of it, you, you jam mm -hmm. into it uh, rocks and gems and sharp objects. They didn't have steel, uh, but sharp rocks. And, and you're going to hit people with that. Now, you can knock somebody silly with that if you hit them in the head. But you hit them on the body or whatnot, I might cut them a little bit, but it's not going to be anywhere near a fatal blow, right? And their goal with these flat weapons was to knock you unconscious, to knock another Indian unconscious so they could take him prisoner, so they could sacrifice him later or turn him into a slave to build the Aztec pyramids. I strongly recommend a scene from a movie, not the whole movie, but a scene from a movie by Mel Gibson called Apocalypto. And this movie is about the Mayans, not the Aztecs, but the principle is the same. And there's a great scene in Apocalypto where the camera pans back and shows thousands of these slaves building one of these Mayan temples. And it would have been exactly the same with the Aztecs. Um, the movie itself, eh, it, it's all in, Gibson put it all in ancient Mayan with subtitles. Uh, so that makes it problematic. It's a very dark movie about, you know, these Indians that get captured and escape and fight the, the Mayans and so on and so forth. Um, but that one scene is extremely valuable for those of you with kids. If you can find this movie and preview it, but look at that scene. It's a tremendous reminder that there was slavery going on 300 years before it really took root in America, or 219, 20 years before it took root in America, that all, everybody say after me, all, that all these Indian tribes practiced slavery, and that many of them, including the Aztecs and the Mayans, practiced human sacrifice to their gods. So the Western way of war would seek to use the, the wall of pikemen advancing in front of the 
musketeers and the crossbowmen to keep the enemy at bay, keep them far enough away from you that you can at leisure, more or less, fire and reload. And it took about 45 seconds to a minute to reload one of these early harquebuses. A harquebus was an early form of a musket, and uh, you had to uh, load the powder and the ball and wadding down the barrel. You put your ramrod away, very important. You don't want to be shooting your ramrod out, right? You then take powder, uh, and you would have it in a, a, a powder mm -hmm. horn or some sort of container. Pull the plug out with your teeth. It's attached by a string. You pour a little bit of powder in what was called the flash pan. This is where we get our phrase, a flash in the pan. And you jam up your horn, put it back, and you would have a what was called a match. A match was really a burning mini rope, a little shoestring kind of burning rope that was held in place by a, a hammer that you pulled back, okay? You don't want to get it too close to the pan until you're ready to fire. And uh, this was problematic, needless to say, in rain or damp conditions. Um, this is why the American frontiersmen, when they could, switched to flint and went to a flint lock versus a match lock because you didn't have to keep that part of the powder dry. All you had to do is keep the powder in the pan dry long enough to pull the trigger, strike a spark with the flint, and create the explosion. So with the match lock, you've got this burning match all the time, big long cord draped down, and when you're ready to go, you pull the trigger, and the match would touch into the flash pan and send the ball sailing out. So you can see it's going to be at best, a slow process that the slightest thing, a wind could blow the powder out of the pan. It's, it's not an easy process. But these guys could operate these weapons, these harquebuses, in about a minute, get off a shot every minute. Crossbowmen could fire maybe three times a minute, depending on their type of crossbows. <clears throat> Some of the crossbows of the day were stirrup crossbows. And, and literally, you put your foot through a stirrup at the bottom and you just pulled the string back and hooked it by a latch, put your bolt on, you were ready to fire. Others were what I call egg beater crossbows. They had a, a handle you had to wind, and it pulled the string back. You laid your bolt in. Crossbows fired a bolt that would go about 30, 50 yards max with power. A extreme penetration at narrower, um, shorter ranges. Um, but again, it's a slow process. Of maybe you're going to get off two to three shots a minute in combat. You've got to remember, you're depending, as a musketeer, a harkbusser, or a crossbowman, you're depending on that front rank of the soldiers uh, keeping the enemy away with the pikes. So, so where's the cavalry and all this? They're in the back. You don't send the cavalry in unless it's absolutely necessary mm -hmm. because they're too vulnerable in confined areas uh, to foot troops who can stab the horses or otherwise overwhelm a cavalryman. So if something would happen and, and the Aztecs would get too close or threaten to break through the wall of pikemen, the Spaniards would just fall back and the cavalry would rush through and drive the Aztecs back, then they would come back. Same thing with the cannons. You keep the cannons at a fairly close range where they can uh, lob these balls. Uh, balls did not explode at this time. It wasn't, that didn't happen. They bounced. They would hit and bounce through. And if you're looking at very thick ranks of Aztecs confined on these narrow causeways, it might be only 50, uh, 50 yards wide, you're just going to take people out like bowling pins with artillery. Um, but here's the key. All of this shock combat depended on staying in rank. You had to rely on those guys up front to stay in the rank, to not break, either to run or more likely to go chasing off after the enemy. If they broke a little bit and you, you wanted to get 
final victory and go get them. You had to, you had to resist that. It was more important that you stay in rank than that you kill enemy. I know that sounds weird, but the, the rank was everything. Keeping the force together was everything, because as long as those guys were together, the Aztecs couldn't break their ranks. And, and so they literally pushed themselves inside Tenochtitlan. Remember I said they had retreated out of Tenochtitlan? Same way. Uh, they, would, they would fire a volley, and the pikemen would, would go up and keep the enemy at bay while other members were dragging bodies up to form little barricades, and you'd fire a round with a cannon and pull it back a few hundred feet and r rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat. And, and they did this all the way out of those causeways, just killing thousands a as they left. So when they return, I mentioned these uh, brigantines. And by the way, Cortez himself was uh, imprisoned when he got back to Veracruz on, on some charges by the governor of Veracruz, who eventually had to let him go. And uh, the crown sends over reinforcements so that he comes back with about 1,000 to 1,200 men. Um, but this time, he has his men build these small boats called brigantines, about 18, 20 feet long, and they had a single cannon in the bow. And they had to transport these overland, carrying them on top of their shoulders and their heads all the way from Veracruz, Mexico, to modern-day Mexico City region, to Tenochtitlan. Uh, and when they got there, they put all of these brigantines on the outside of Tenochtitlan along the lake. When they were ready to attack, they sail in and begin shelling and besieging the city from the lake side. Now what's again important, and Hansen makes this point, is that these brigantines were vastly superior shipbuilding technology than the Aztecs had, and the Aztecs lived on the lake, and they hadn't come up with something like this. Uh, I mentioned the, the wheel. Um, it was, what, a thousand years? after the wheel was invented, 2,000 years after the wheel's invented, and they still don't have the wheel. And I'm sorry, folks, this is backwards. This is a backward society. Yeah, the nice, nice temples and all that sort of stuff. But to lack the wheel, which you could have used for pulleys to bring rocks and stuff up for transportation. And then, more important, the wheel becomes the basis for the whole matchlock, flintlock, eventual musket technology because it allows the gears uh, to pull a hammer down okay so you're going to see in the west it's very important in the west these technologies are not just military technologies sometimes they're invented for the military sometimes they're invented for civilian use and they spread to the military sometimes invented by the military they spread to civilian use but the most important thing is innovation because in the west you start to get this ongoing innovation and you start to get people going oh i can do that better oh that gives me an idea of what i could do with that over here oh let me apply this to this project and this constant innovation is really what technical technological progress is all about it's not just one invention that's the big breakthrough um, the musket, as you know, uh, gunpowder was invented in China, but the Chinese didn't have effective muskets uh, nearly as soon as the Europeans did because they lacked a lot of the complementary technologies. Uh, an economic historian named Joel Mokir, M-O-K-Y-R, has in a number of books and papers gone into this, as has economic historian David Landis, L-A-N-D-E-S, and many, many others, and Han Hansen goes into this in his book. But the point is, where does this come from? All of this Western way of war, next step, the technology, next step, the innovation and, and scientific breakthroughs, all of this comes from a Western concept of science that says that you can know things, that God wants us 
to know things. Remember, God says to David, come, let us reason together. Let, let's use our minds, buddy. And so the West and nowhere else, sorry, you globalist people, but the West and nowhere else develops the scientific method. This is one reason, folks, why they're coming so hard after the scientific method and proving things by science. See, they don't ever want to use science until it comes to certain medical procedures. But um, so you should trust the science there, but not trust the science everywhere else. But it's it's a scientific method that is developed in the West alone. And what is the scientific method? Uh, I'm sure all your, your kids hear about this. It is you form a hypothesis. You get an idea. Well, what if? Why is there air? Right? Bill Cosby, when he used to be funny, used to have this album called Why Is There Air? Uh, or a comedy routine called Why Is There Air? So you form a hypothesis. You gather evidence. Here's what I think would be used to test this hypothesis to see if it's correct. You conduct an experiment with this evidence. Now, of course, later, other people are going to say, you didn't gather the right evidence or you didn't do the experiment right. That's all valid. But I'm just telling you the basics of the scientific method. So you form a hypothesis, you gather evidence, you do an experiment. You reach a conclusion based on the results of that experiment. And here's the real key for the scientific method to be scientific. You repeat the experiment. Other people using the same exact formula, using this, this number of this metal or whatever it is at this temperature will give you this result every single time. Then you can, with some degree of certainty, claim a, <clears throat> excuse me, a scientific fact. It's the corroboration and being able to repeat the experiment that makes it science. That's why political science is garbage. And I say that as somebody who has a degree, a BA in political science. But it cannot be scientific. Why, Swikart? Because you can't repeat the experiment. People change. Anything that involves people's attitudes and, and behaviors mm -hmm. changes, sometimes totally irrationally, often within minutes. So that's why pollsters have such trouble. Uh, you can ask somebody in a poll, well, what do you think of candidate X? And they say, I won't vote for them ever. And five minutes later, they could hear something on the news and go, oh, maybe candidate X is not so bad, and change their mind. And this is why so often polls will say one thing and an election outcome will say another. Uh, there's also other things involved, including, you know, the F word, fraud. But, um, and we have a lot of history of that in the United States going all the way back to early, early elections. But um, it may just be that people change their minds between the time they told a pollster something and the time they actually cast a vote. And, and the great economist Thomas Sowell is, and Milton Friedman both used to explain how uh, it's easy to say, I favor this, or I like this product, or I don't like that product, or I'll watch this TV show, or I, I won't watch it. It's quite another to actually do it. When you have to vote, when you have to buy a product, you are now acting, and that's different than saying. People can and do say anything but what do their actions do, right? So political science is, I'm sorry, it's bogus because you can never repeat the experiment because a person changes from the time you did the first experiment with them to the time you did the second experiment, even if it's only hours, days, minutes away. People change. Um, and sometimes they change irrationally. They, you know, they work by feelings. Um, so... At any rate, the scientific method has this procedure. 
where you form a hypothesis, you gather evidence, you produce a test, you come to a conclusion, and you must reproduce the test in order for it to be scientific. So we've gone from um, Western way of war to the next lower level, which is Western technology, to the next lower level, which is Western science. So what undergirds the whole knowledge of Western science? Because remember, all of the early scientists, people like Bacon and Newton, were Christians. And it is this notion that God gives man the ability mm -hmm. to investigate his surroundings, um, to examine things, to explore. That's why I keep saying that only a free society can be an exploring society in the long run. Uh, because you might come back with answers the rulers don't like or that the established religion doesn't want to hear. Um, so, so you get down to this level where the Judeo-Christian ethic underscores the notion of doing science, that, that God is knowable not just in the realm of faith, but God is knowable in the, in the realm of knowledge as well. And, and yes, you do have to get to that point where you take the famous leap of faith. You can't completely prove God by science um, or it wouldn't involve any faith at all, right? Um, faith is the evidence, what, of things not seen. So th there are aspects of, of religion Christianity that you're never going to 100% prove because it would take away the very faith that is required to, well, be a Christian. So it is this notion in the Western system that God expects man to use his brain and to explore and to investigate and to um, uh, develop uh, new tools and, and new technologies and new concepts to work with those tools and technologies. So a society that does not have that, that won't have the scientific method, and thus it is going to be very, very constrained. You're not only not going to have a wheel, you're not going to have all of the stuff that wheels enable, you're not going to have all the technology that is enabled, and you're not going to have the freedom to explore, expand, question. Remember I said that Cortez's lieutenants would debate with him tactics and strategy. And I'm not saying he always listen, but uh, he didn't always discount them. Remember, Columbus had to keep the trust and the faith of his men, of his sailors, when he crossed um, the ocean. And, and so this is all a part of not being a top-down dictatorial society. Remember in the, in the introduction, I talked about the bottom-up, concept of common law and that's where that comes into play here when we're talking about Cortez in Mexico is this is all the result of the Western way of war all comes down to the fact that that to a large degree the West is freer than any other area because of the Christian principles that enable it to to explore and to engage in science that some may, may later say, well, this undercuts Christianity. Well, maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. But only in the West do you have that freedom to do that. And I, I would remind you, for example, that with the Taliban in Afghanistan, flying a kite was prohibited as an offense to Allah. Well, folks, you're not going to build an airplane if you can't fly a kite. Because you're not going to know about aerodynamics and wings and all that other stuff, right? So right there, you just you're never going to get into space. Um, all right. Well, let's continue then. If Europeans resembled other cultures in their attitude toward conquest, they differed substantially in their practice and effectiveness. The Spanish especially proved adept at defeating native peoples for three reasons. First, they were mobile. Horses and ships endowed the Spanish with vast advantages in mobility over natives. Second, the burgeoning economic power of Europe enabled quantum leaps over Middle Eastern, Asian, and Mesoamerican cultures. This economic wealth made possible the shipping and equipping of large, trained, well-armed forces if you needed them. 
non-military technolo technological advances, such as the iron tip plow, the windmill, the water wheel, all had spread through Europe and allowed monarchs to employ fewer resources in their farming sector and more in science, engineering, writing, and the military. A natural outgrowth of this economic wealth was improved military technology, including guns, which made any single Spanish soldier the equal of several poorly armed natives, offsetting the latter's numerical advantage. But these two factors were magnified by a third element, the glue that held it all together, which was the Western way of combat that emphasized a group cohesion of free citizens. Like the ancient Greeks and Romans, Cortez's Castilians fought from a long tradition of practical adaptation based on individual freedom, civic rights, and, quote, a preference for shock battle of heavy infantry that, quote, grew out of consensual government, equality among the middling classes, and other distinctly Western traits that gave numerically inferior European armies a decisive edge. That made it possible for tiny expeditions such as Ponce de Leon's with only 200 men and 50 horses, or Narvaez with a force of 600, including cooks, colonists, and women, to overcome native armies outnumbering them two, three, and even ten times at any particular time. I'll throw in here one Pizarro, who with, I think it was, 80 soldiers, uh, took down the entire um, civilization, uh, the native civilization, in Inca civilization in Peru. More to the point, no native culture could have conceived of maintaining expeditions of thousands of men in the field for months at a time. Virtually all of the natives lived off the land and took slaves back to their home as opposed to colonizing new territory with their own settlers. Indeed, only the European industrial engine could have provided the material wherewithal to maintain such armies and only the European political constructs of liberty, property rights, and nationalism kept men in combat for abstract political causes. In other words, you could send an army away and not be afraid it was going to dissipate or peel off because uh, it was kept in, in place only by a commander. No, these guys were kept in place by ideals and concepts that they brought with them from Europe that said that they had a larger picture in mind. European combat style produced yet another advantage in that firearms showed no favoritism on the battlefield. Spanish gunfire destroyed the hierarchy of the enemy, including the aristocratic dominant political class. Aztec chiefs and Moorish sultans alike were completely vulnerable to massed firepower, yet without the legal framework of republicanism and civic virtue like Europe's to replace its leadership cadre. A native army could be decapitated at the head of one volley, whereas Spanish forces could see lieutenants fall and seamlessly replace them with sergeants. So um, I want to stop there and, because our next segment is... Excuse me while well, this buzzer stops. Um, I want to pick up our next segment because we have very few big inserts left in the book. When we started, we had these big block inserts uh, of biographies of people like Mike Fink, you know, and, uh, and Davy Crockett and things like that, Daniel Boone, and uh, theoretical historical questions. Um, what was the free silver movement or so, something like that. And over time, because we had to keep adding to the book because we had to keep expanding the material, we had to remove almost all these. And these are mostly available in one form or another <clears throat> on the Wild World of History website. Uh, many of them are free in my little vignettes in there. Uh, many of them are part of the VIP subscription, so you might want to take a look at that. It's $6 a month, $69 a year, um, for access to all the stuff on the VIP side. And this includes uh, four video lesson series, one on Reagan, the American president, 21 videos, one on the 1620 default and why the 1619 project is full of hooey, and that one's about 11 videos. Uh, a three, four video set on the horrible history of Howard Zinn, 
a great series called Enduring Lessons on Life and Citizenship for Your Kids. Some of these are only four to five to eight minutes, and they talk about the connection between time and money or socialism and capitalism. And then you also get a, a free book on cell phones and the damage cell phones can do and how to, how to manage those called All Thumbs in PDF. All of this is part of the VIP package, so check that out at the Wild World of History. Um, but getting back to the sidebars, as we call them, this is the last remaining sidebar, and we, we just had to keep this one in. And so what we're getting at next time is called, Did Columbus Kill All the Indians? The sidebar that goes on for almost four pages here in the book in small print, because this was such an important topic, we needed to discuss this at length. Um, so that's where we're going to stop today. And um, I'm going to um, pick up here in just a few minutes with um, Patriot Plus because our local channel has been um, cut off for the current time. Uh, we don't have the right plan. I've got to get that worked out. But we'll eventually put Patriot Plus over on locals. And um, so I will stream Patriot Plus here in about uh, 15 minutes. Meanwhile, every week, if you have questions, my chat isn't up and running yet. I'm still learning all this technology. Send me your question at Larry at WildWorldOfHistory.com, and I'll try to get to it first thing. Remember to check out uh, the Wild World of History lessons in U.S. and world history. We have a full, full curriculum in U.S. history from Columbus to Trump, as I say, uh, for 179 convention price right now. includes all the lessons one per chapter of Patriots History of the United States and 22 videos, one per chapter of me teaching the whole thing in video form. Same thing with world history. World history from 1775 to the present and I give you 15 uh, videos that go along with that. It's all digital, all downloadable and uh, no license to expire so you can use it with as many kids as you want. We also have a brand new book offer up at Wild World of History, which is all of Larry's other books that you almost never hear of, including America's Victories, my um, counterfactual about World War II called Halsey's Bluff about the Battle of Midway, uh, Dragon Slayers, and several other books there at a remarkable price, all autographed and shipped to you. Mm -hmm. So check that out, and we will pick up back here on the Wild World of History channel in about 15 minutes.